This next speaker is an enterprise SEO powerhouse. Jackie is currently the SEO intelligence lead at Hoover's HQ in San Francisco, where she drives SEO data and tooling for all of Uber's SEO teams globally. Prior to Hoover, she worked at Square, Dropbox, and she spent early years in media and publishing. Today, she's talking about how to go global without losing all of your traffic. I've been fortunate to share many clubhouse stages with Jackie, and the depth and breadth of her SEO knowledge is truly shocking. So I'm truly excited to see what she has in store for us today. Take it away, Jackie. My name is Jackie, and today we're going to talk about my favorite thing big sites screw up, and that's internationalization errors, also known as how to go global without losing all of your traffic. My name is Jackie, and in case we haven't met, um, I'm currently the SEO intelligence lead at Uber. That's just a really fancy way of saying that my team does the data and tooling for global SEO teams. Um, prior to that, I was the App Store optimization and SEO lead at Dropbox, a cloud storage company in the Bay Area. And um, then prior to that, I was the senior SEO and ASO manager at Square. So I like to tell people that I like to do um, RSU for SEOs, and I really like acronyms. Um, so in a nutshell, you know, like, just like all aspects of SEO, internationalization is really complicated. There's so many factors, um, but internationalization really boils down to three things. Having unique URLs for all versions of your content. Googlebot does not click, they don't scroll, so you need to have unique URLs for Googlebot to index and discover content. And the next thing is implementing hreflang, an HTML directive, between those pages so that Google can understand what pages map to which languages. Um, and the last one is having truly localized content per region. Once you have all the technical stuff handled, it can seem like your job is done. But the reality is a lot of times internationalization actually brings along a lot of content challenges and content duplication issues. So we'll talk a little bit that, about that today. So here's what I hope you guys will walk away with. Um, hopefully learn, you'll learn the rights and wrongs of hreflang. Also some common internationalization mistakes to avoid and how to make a foolproof template or information architecture that even Googlebot cannot mess up. I'll basically show you guys the happy path of internationalization. So first off, let's talk about hreflang. Uh, and this is my quick hreflang 101. Uh, hreflang is really simple in concept, but the reality is it's not simple in implementation. There's a lot of business considerations you need to consider. And I know you guys are thinking, Jackie, you know, out of all the SEO things that they don't tell you how to do, uh, hreflang should be simple, right? I mean, Google actually gives you documentation. They're basically like spoon feeding you the answers. But the reality is it's really complicated in practice. Uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, ask John himself. He said, to be honest, hreflang is one of the most complex aspects of SEO, if not the most complex one. Feels as easy as a meta tag, but it gets hard really quickly. So what's at risk if you get all this wrong? The reality is if you get internationalization wrong, you can actually stop ranking competitively for your own keywords. I've seen sites rank as low as six or seven for their own brand terms when they mess up internationalization. Here's an example from Hermes. So I did a search for Hermes customer support. I'm based in the United States. And in this result, I actually saw a result from the Netherlands. So you can tell that this is a really bad result for me. Imagine if I was actually searching for more of a transaction word, I was ready to purchase. This would be a horrible experience for me. So it's really important to get internationalization correct you can, or else you won't even rank for your own brand words, at least not well. Uh, so here are some basics of hreflang. So first off, what is hreflang? I've been talking about it quite a lot. So hreflang, the rel alternate hreflang equals blank link attribute is an HTML meta element. HREFLANG specifies the language and optional geographic restrictions for a document. That's really important, optional geographic. A lot of times people think a lot about the country that they're serving, but the reality is HREFLANG is actually language first. It's really, really focused on language. Geography is actually an additional optional attribute. This will be a little bit more relevant later. Um, but basically HREFLANG, what does it help you do? It helps you implement country and language targeting, or again, language only. The only thing that you must have is language. Um, you implement it uh, through reciprocal links, a set of links that uh, assumption is that since you're using hreflang, you have multiple versions of a document in different languages. All those documents should point to each other. That's called reciprocity, reciprocal links. Um, you should have a self-referencing canonical. The canonical should point to itself always just as in SEO best practices. Um, a lot of times people will actually set the canonical to like the English URL or whatever base language they're using. That's wrong. Google will actually then see the rest of your content because you're telling them it's a duplicate and that's a confusing signal for them. Um, and lastly, you should have an hreflang to yourselves. So um, all URLs point to each other and to themselves, and they have a self-referencing canonical. Um, and you can really implement this in actually three different places. You can implement it in the HTTP headers, 
on page in the head. That's my personal favorite. I think it's the easiest to debug um, or, or in the sitemap. Uh, this is probably my least favorite only because I've heard some people have some issues with Google picking it up in the sitemap. And it also is very challenging since you have to go back and forth between the live page and the sitemap, but it is technically an option. So what does the ideal hreflang implementation look like? So here's an example of one tag for Canadian English. So in this instance, you know, yoursite.com forward slash CA forward slash EN, I'm targeting this towards English Canada. The order is also important. Language goes first and then uh, the country you're targeting in the attribute. Um, and here's an example of hreflang for the Can Canada English page. Um, so in this case, I have two different pages. I have Canada for English, uh, a canonical pointing to myself, um, then I also have the hreflang tag for uh, Canada English for my CAEN URL. And I also have a duplicate of this page in the United States. So here I have uh, the same exact page, USEN, and you can see that the HTML attribute has also changed to ENUS. And then also I added in one extra, which is X default. This is an optional directive. Um, a lot of times people will use this as a fallback in case there's no other languages. Maybe let's say someone who speaks uh, uh, Italian tries to look for your site, you don't have an Italian page, what site should Google show them? In this case, I'm telling them, show them the United States English. People will also usually use this as like a catch-all too. Maybe they have some kind of IB-based language, language text detection. Um, then this is a, a good attribute to use, but again, it's not necessary. And so one of the most important things you have to think about when you're setting up hreflang is are you targeting a country and language or are you targeting language only? Language, again, is the only non-optional uh, attribute. So in this case, I have your website, uh, C-A-E-N, and the hreflang attribute is E-N-C-A. Um, the next example I have is yoursite.com. Maybe this is just my global English page. And so the hreflang attribute is just E-N. And lastly, uh, here's an example of something I commonly see, but it's actually not correct. Maybe I have my site, uh, Canada subfolder, and my hreflang attribute is only Canada. Canada is a language, uh, can, sorry, Canada is a country, it is not a language, and therefore this is not a correct implementation of hreflang. You can't target country only. So one thing I would like you to consider is that not every site needs to do country targeting. For example, we have sites like publishers that where as long as you speak English, you can consume the same site, um, or a global SaaS site where there's no real difference in features between countries. and companies where you actually don't have the bandwidth to differentiate content. A lot of times when people will launch in uh, another country, even if they speak the same language, they have a need to launch you know, a new, new country subfolder or a new CCTLD. Um, I highly suggest not doing this if you don't actually have the bandwidth to differentiate content because you could very easily run into a diff uh, duplicate content issue. Um, so once you have hreflang set up, there are a few tools you can use to try to check if your hreflang implementation is correct. Um, Screaming Frog, most actually modern crawlers have some kind of tool to check for things like, do you have a reciprocal hreflang, self-referential, et cetera. Um, Search Console also has an international targeting report, which is awesome. And you can also even do geo-targeting inside of Search Console, which I'll show you how to do later. And Lighthouse Reports, there's also an additional hreflang report inside there. You can check if Google's actually picking up your hreflang. Um, in summary, hreflangs need all URLs in the set to canonize themselves, have an hreflang to themselves, point to all other URLs in the set, and all those URLs should point to it. Um, it should also target either a country and language or a global language page. And next up, we're going to talk about some common internationalization mistakes to avoid. Again, this is something that's a real challenge for really big companies. So we're going to look at a few really big companies that haven't quite nailed this yet. Uh, so one of the biggest mistakes is not having unique URLs for content. So in this case, I'm looking at the Canadian version of nextdoor.com. Um, they're targeting ca.nextdoor.com forward slash the same URL twice. One time they're targeting it to English uh, speaking Canadians and also French speaking Canadians. It sounds like a great idea because there is a very large French speaking demographic in Canada. However, you can see that they're trying to do this on the same URL. So let's see what happens. So here I am on the French Canadian Nextdoor homepage. I'm gonna scroll a little bit up. Oh, let's grab this H1. I'm gonna copy this H1. I'm going into Google. And I'm going to do a search for this with quotations to see, hey, have you seen this content? No result. Uh, Google fundamentally needs a URL to index and discover content. It cannot do user interactions um, like scroll or clicking. And so you really need to have unique URLs to index uh, for Google search. This is really how like most search works. It works on using an index. Without a unique URL to index, no, no differentiated URLs for search. 
Another important thing to keep in mind, another reason why this is a really bad idea, is because Googlebot, the thing that actually indexes the web, comes from the US about 99% of the time. If you ever actually look at your Googlebot data, you'll notice that um, most of the time it comes from the US. And if you ever actually see other countries in there, a lot of times it's actually fake Googlebots and your data is dirty. That's actually like one of my leading indicators that there's an issue with data if I see a lot of non-US based IP addresses. So this is really important. And of course you would be a, Googlebot would be a Warriors fan if you was <laughs> a person, you told me. Another really common mistake I encounter is people using four letter language codes. And what I mean is rather than just target, you know, FR, they are now targeting French Canadian speakers specifically, or they're targeting things like Spain Spanish speakers. And honestly, this is honestly just like a micro optimization. A lot of times, a lot of times it's not actually valuable to try to target these like incremental languages. A lot of times Google doesn't actually think that they're materially different enough to rank the content differently. And it can create a lot of cannibalization issues as well as some automation errors. So in this case, we're going to look at Stripe's homepage for French Canadian speakers in the Arab Emirates. So this is really confusing and it's probably created some kind of issues because French Canadian was saved as its own individual language. And now you have an hreflang attribute that's automatically populated that is targeting French, Canada as a geography and Arab Emirates. And this is really confusing for Google. And then also it's just not valid. The main exception to this four letter language code is going to be Chinese. So on the left, you can see we use simplified Chinese. That's used in China and Singapore. And on the right, you have traditional Chinese. It's a little bit more complicated and it's used in places like Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Macau. And I really like the language codes because I feel like they're kind of easy to remember because they give you little hints. So ZH Hans ends with an S, that's for simplified Chinese. And ZH Hunt ends with a T, and that's for traditional Chinese. So yeah, I like that you have little hints to remember which one to use where. Mistake number three. Uh, creating duplicate content issues by not differentiating the content. So again, po poking a little bit of fun at Stripe. Uh, so if you were to look at Stripe's homepage right now, you would see 574 hreflang attributes. This is probably because um, they decided to create a different version of their site, or at least duplicate their site, for every single flavor of language they support in every single country they wanted to target. Now they have 574 pieces of content for homepages, just, just homepages. Uh, of which, by the way, 82 of these are English. It's a lot of, a lot of competing English pages now. Um, it's a huge mistake to optimize, I think, over-optimize for flavors of languages. Again, because like looking at this again, it's now created an autom automation error. So here they're trying to target like ENNZ, but they also target things like uh, English for Great Britain, but with uh, New Zealand consumers in mind. This is a nonsensical hreflang in addition to being a little bit spammy. And the reality is a lot of these pages are not materially different. Let's compare that US page to UAE homepage. Uh, it looks like I basically copy and pasted the same exact screenshot over each other, but that's not actually what happened. These are actually the two homepages for these two separate countries. So I decided to run these through a diff checker and about 96% of the content on these pages is the same. So trying to find, you know, well, what, what part of the page is actually unique. Uh, you can see they've made really compelling changes, like they changed companies, the businesses, uh, changed an M dash to hyphen. Um, check out Fortune 500, probably in the non-US page, but you know the reality is, guys, this is this is really not like compelling uh, differentiation. Uh, and if you ever run into a duplicate content problem, which I almost guarantee you they have, uh, what you can actually do is you can go into Search Console look for the URL of the page that you think is being ignored, that Google is not indexing, uh, inspect that URL inside of Search Console, and if the user declared canonical is actually different than the Google selected canonical, then you definitely have a duplicate content issue and you need to get rid of those duplicate pages or you need to um, truly differentiate the content on those pages. Again, simple in concept, very difficult in uh, practice. Um, so there are some ways that you can kind of build differentiation into your site's HTML footprint. This is probably not going to be enough if the only thing you're doing is changing how you spell things like color or personalization. But there are some things you can do that are kind of considered best practice. One is append the country name to your title tag. So in this case, I'm looking at home pages. So the brand name is front loaded. A lot of times you will actually append this to the end of the title tag. Um, so that way you can still keep like your SEO keywords inside the title tag. But in this case, we're looking at home pages. So you can see Disney.com is just Disney.com, but Disney UK actually has Disney UK in the title tag. It's a really easy, lowbrow way to kind of add a little bit of differentiation between the content. Next up 
is, you know, do a little bit of local SEO, add your name, address, phone number, and your NAP to the footer. Um, it's a really good, strong, like signal for all those pages that this content is actually meant, you know, for users in the UK, or it's meant for um, users in Australia. If you actually have those local addresses, I would highly suggest you use them. And also don't forget things too, like, you know, linking to your local social handles. If you have a Japanese uh, specific Twitter, then you should actually link, link to that from the Japan site. Don't link to your English Twitter handle. All of these are small signals that kind of add up and help like clarify your country targeting to Google. So these are small and easy lowbrow ways to kind of um, add a little bit more context to Google for who you're trying to target. And my last one, this is actually one of my favorites. You can't do this for every page, but one of my favorite things to do is to actually add local vendors and reviews. It's kind of like a mix between a uh, Crow and SEO because it's nice, you know, in this case, I'm using Square. Um, the vendors that we chose were Shake Shack, Ben & Jerry's, uh, Caviar. These are all local United States-based businesses. It adds a little bit more context to the page. Google knows that this is a US-based entity, um, but in this case, uh, it also helps us enrich the page while it helps people convert as well. So this is like one of my favorite ways to differentiate the content just because I think there's a lot of value from both an SEO perspective and from a um, technical SEO and targeting perspective too. And Crow. Okay, and next up the perfect international IA. If I were to start any site over again, and the reality is this is very rare, you guys, a lot of sites aren't international to begin with, right? A lot of times when you come in, you're coming in to clean house and to help fix things because a lot of times people, you know, don't start building uh, the perfect international IA from the start. But if you were, what would like a happy path look like? And this is something I think if it was, everything was like this, uh, Googlebot would not be able to screw it up. Uh, the most important thing when you first start doing an international site is you have to think, how are we gonna create these unique URLs, right? Um, you have the choice between three different options. You can do a CCTLD or a top level domain. So this example would be like your website.ca or your website.uk uh, or whatever. Or, uh, and that's a really good way if you want to have something feel like very local and endemic to um, the user base. The next one is a subfolder. Uh, this one's also pretty popular, uh, basically just adding you know country as a subfolder, just like you would like a category page or any other like IA on your site. And the next one's a subdomain. So in this case for Canada, maybe it's like ca.yourwebsite.com. And so there's pros and cons to each. So the pros of a CCTLD, again, feels really endemic to the user. You know, that's gonna be a domain that they can trust because they're like, oh, that's coming from where I live. And the cons are, it's, it's its own site. So it's expensive to deploy and maintain. Uh, it's also treated as its own domain. You don't get the kind of value of being on this like one site, everything is consolidated, all the link equity is consolidated on one site. So it could take a little bit longer to grow at start. Um, next up is subfolder. This is honestly the easiest implementation. You only have one search console account to set up. You don't have to have a separate domain registration. You can really just do a lot of like the backend SEO uh, data work yourself. Um, but you don't have an ability to fully, lo fully localize URLs a lot of times, which could kind of like hurt click through rate if you're dealing with like some low trust countries. Um, the last one is a subdomain. Uh, much like the CCTLD, it's pretty much treated as its own domain. I guess it's nice because it doesn't require, you know, a separate domain registration. Um, you could create a domain property in GSC, but it's still kind of fundamentally its own domain. So it's expensive to deploy and maintain, and it's also going to take a little bit longer to grow because Google's kind of treating it as its own site. It doesn't get a ride on the coattails of your US-based site. Uh, my personally, I think the Goldilocks solution is honestly the subfolder solution. It's easier to implement. Um, you also only have like one service to maintain versus like, you know, many other services and servers and different GSC verifications, et cetera. And the main trade-off is sometimes the URLs don't feel super endemic to the country again. Uh, next up, let's talk about URL structure. So once you have your kind of uh, geographical structure, your country structure, how are you going to think about your URLs? So um, my favorite thing to do is actually lead with the country folder in the slug if you guys are using one. Use ISO codes because that's really important because it helps uh, follow web norms. It helps, you know, again, take away a little bit of the guesswork for Google. If you ever use things, if you ever like uh, delineate or use a hyphen between your country and language, it's really important that you're using hyphens in your URLs and not underscores, which can kind of like, catch up some of the old like antiquated bots a bit. So my first suggestion is lead with country and the slug. This makes it a lot easier to do any kind of like data warehousing projects if you ever want to, you know, stitch back together your Canada data. It also makes it a lot easier in addition to doing analytics. I'm doing things like a search console submission. You know, one of the things I really like doing is adding all of my country subfolders to search console and target them in GSC. That's going to be a lot more difficult if country is not leading in your URL slug. So use your country first. And you know, honestly, 
one or two folders, it's all good. A lot of times people are scared to add a, a extra folder. Like in this case, I'm targeting uh, English speaking Canadians. Um, it's fine to honestly use a hyphen in between the country or language inside your URL or to have two folders, one for the country, one for the language. A lot of times people get scared of adding that folder. They're like, if I add the folder, it's farther away from the home page. That's very more like causation correlation. The most important thing is internal links um, and having the right on-page optimization, you know, technical excellence, et cetera. How many folders as something's in the URL or deep down it is in the URL structure of your site is not a real consideration. So again, one or two folders, all good. Um, if you're doing language only targeting too, uh, I would highly suggest adding a subfolder ahead of that language. This is mostly for analytics. And so this way, when you guys do analytics, uh, if you wanna look at the performance of all of those little uh, language pages, then this way you have something to actually look for to like perform regexes on. Um, in this case, I chose Lang, it could be L, it could be anything you honestly want it to be. Again, don't be afraid of adding this extra folder. It really helps from a uh, data warehousing perspective. And next up, Use ISO codes. There are standard ways to abbreviate languages um, and as well as countries. Uh, so in this case, I am looking at Adobe who suffers from quite a bit of international SEO issues as well. Uh, and you can see that sometimes they use the ISO code to designate the country in the URL. In this case, you know, you have uh, Adobe for IE. Um, I have like Mina as being a country and the other box. Uh, now I'm targeting Africa. This, this is really kind of like all over the place as far as like the URL structure. And the problem with that is that now you've lost, again, an additional signal that Google could have used to try to understand what part of your website is trying to target what country. So now you've made one signal a little bit darker for them and you're allowing them to make up like more inferences, which generally doesn't tend to work in your favor. So use ISO, don't um, avoid these kind of like unnatural URL patterns. It just adds one more difficulty for Google to pick up what it is you're trying to actually do with your site. And uh, delivering distribution. This is a really important part of having an international site. Highly suggest uh, getting a CDN. This is really critical for global performance because now you know, when, people, when a user does a request, they're getting the site from a server that's close to them. Um, also, think about mobile first. You know, uh, the reality is in the US, a lot of people have desktops, they have laptops. Uh, but a lot of other countries, a lot of people just have a mobile device. And a lot of times that's not even, you know, an iPhone. It could be an Android or an older version of an iPhone. So it's really important to um, not discount the prevalence of things like, you know, Android and not having a desktop. Um, and lastly, optimize for your slowest market. Your speed is often determined by your floor, not your ceiling. You know, if you're based in the United States, you might have very, very good bandwidth depending on where you are. But if you're, you know, based somewhere else where maybe there's a different connection or, you know, an older model phone, you don't actually have the same experience that you do in the U.S. consuming your site. Take this as an example. We're going to compare the Stripe homepage to the Stripe homepage for the UAE. And you can see vastly different experiences for, you know, some of the core web biometrics like uh, first contentful paint and largest contentful paint, um, first input delay, very, very different experiences, even though these are technically supposed to be the same site. Um, and lastly, as a catch-all, a lot of times people will try to, you know, have these little mobile pop-ups, like if they notice that the URL you're trying to request doesn't actually match the country code you're in. And so in this case, I am on the Square Australia site. Uh, it's telling me, hey, you're trying to request Australia, but it looks like you're in the U.S. Uh, this is something that's definitely actually best practice just to suggest people to redirect them, but you don't want to force them. Again, remember, Googlebot comes from the U.S., so it's really important that you don't force people based off their IP. And lastly, add all country folders to Search Console. So again, this goes back to starting with country in your URL. It'll make this a lot easier. Add all of your country subfolders into Search Console and then target them using international targeting. Uh, here I'm targeting towards the United States. You know what, that's a lot to recap. We talked about a lot of things, including hreflang. Are you a country agnostic or a country specific site? Do you, your URLs use ISO codes for language and start with country in the slug? Are you using hyphen URLs? There's a lot of things that you can actually mess up when you're doing internationalization at scale. And so because that's a lot to remember, I made a checklist for you guys in a sheet. You guys can check it out at bit.ly um, forward slash Jackie Moscon to see everything you guys are gonna learn in one place. And some last tips for you guys. So one of the thing, one of like the kind of low-hanging fruit ways to localize content and also increase conversions and like how endemic a site feels to its users is to actually update the photos and especially if they're photos of people. So in this case, we're looking at Louis Vuitton in Japan. 
So you can see that they've updated a few of the images on their homepage to make it feel a little bit more endemic to users. Um, this really helps improve per perception and also provides an extra opportunity for you to add unique content that's actually local to that region. Or you can just be Dior and just not show anyone else. This is Dior in Korea, but that's not a problem because all they're showing is bags. And don't be afraid of different layouts. Um, here is an example of Uniqlo in Japan versus the US. You can see they actually use vastly different layouts. And this is nice because it's really differentiating the content, even though a lot of the languages are the same. One of your best friends whenever you're doing SEO is to see what already ranks in SERPs. Um, so in this case, I'm looking at a tablog that is a really common uh, kind of like Yelp for Japan, um, really common there. And you can see that they're actually using these like thick, thick uh, kind of square brackets uh, inside of the SERPs. Uh, this is a really common pattern that you actually see inside mostly Japan and is really, really effective from a garnering click-through perspective. So, you know, look for any unique trends and SERPs that you can use to differentiate the content. An extra credit, uh, if you really just have all the engineering resources in the world and it's not a problem for you, you can actually translate the URLs um, as well. So if looking at this, I'm looking at Square, we did not do that. And so you can see, uh, I see a lot of English metadata, um, meta title, meta description, but my actual URL is still in English. That can be like a little weird to see if I'm not actually a native English speaker. So if you want some extra credit and you have a lot of engineers, that's also an opportunity for you to like really localize that content. And this is my last and most favorite tip. Uh, you know, I didn't talk at all about translation, which is an inevitable part of doing international SEO, but this is something that has made my life infinitely easier. My Google Sheets translation hack. Okay, so inside of Google Sheets, uh, if you have a list of keywords, you can actually do this uh, function and it's amazing. So you just do equals Google Translate, um, A2, uh, like in this case, I'm like selecting my cell. Uh, then I have the origin language. So like, let's say like whatever, I have like my language list, like dog, cat, et cetera. And what do I want my destination language to be? What do I want this to be translated to? So here I'm saying translate A2 from English into Spanish. So here I have dog, cat, mom. I want my destination language to be ES. So you can see I'm creating my formula. I'm like, please translate all this. Yeah, it's my favorite. You can also update that and actually say auto instead of EN. You don't have to actually tell them what the origin language is. They can figure it out. That usually works. It's not perfect, so no promises there, but that's also <laughs> an option for you if you like. And that's it. Hope you guys learned a lot about international SEO and I will catch you guys next time. Thanks.